I am Professor of Gravitational Astrophysics and Cosmology, and that means that I'm interested in big questions about the nature of the universe, questions about how big it is, why it's expanding, how fast it's expanding, will it expand forever, questions like that. And in about the last 15 years or so, I've expanded my focus into this new field of gravitational wave astronomy, and that's allowed me to seek to answer questions about cosmology using a completely new window in the universe, a window that we get from extreme cosmic events, things like colliding black holes and neutron stars. And therefore, I'm interested in gravitational waves, not just to prove that they exist, but to use them as tools to help us answer some of the biggest questions in astrophysics and cosmology. And as I've already hinted, the tools that I use to do all of that are the very same tools that you will learn about as part of the PGT programs that we run in physics and astronomy. And I've played my part in a lot of that too. Um, I was head of school between 2012 and 2020. So during that period, I saw enormous growth in our PGT programs. And indeed, throughout that period, I was also delivering some of the core courses. I've just stopped after 15 years delivering the advanced data analysis course, which is one that everyone does so it's um, relevant and applicable to all of our MSc programs. But the perspective I come at that from, as I was saying a few minutes ago, is from the perspective of um, astrophysics, and in particular, gravitational wave astrophysics. I've also contributed to the course that our astrophysics and theoretical physics MSc students take called um, gravitational wave detection. And this takes advantage of the fact that among universities in the UK, we are effectively the largest group working in gravitational wave astronomy. So this exciting new field, well, you're getting to hear about that and learn about that from world-leading experts. I've also delivered some of the courses which support the MSc. Again, they are optional courses attuned most uh, um, strongly, I guess, to the astrophysics and theoretical physics program. But we've had examples of MSc students on the other programs as well who've just had a passion or an interest in astronomy and astrophysics, and they've, they've taken courses like our one on galaxies, or there's one on stars as well, or our course on cosmology. So there's a wide range of courses available. In the second half of this session, we'll talk more about the structure of the programs and how you go about choosing those courses. But for the rest of this 20 minutes or so, I'm going to focus on what we've been learning about the universe from gravitational waves. So I'm part of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. I'm one of four division heads within this collaboration. There's about 1,500 members worldwide in institutions that span the globe. So frankly, I live my life in telecons. Uh, and although, of course, this last year has been very different for all of us with the global pandemic, um, talking to my colleagues via Zoom was something I was very used to for a number of years before COVID came along. And how LIGO is structured um, reflects the fact that the lead organizations are in the US. So you can see in the map in the top right that there are lots of little pins in US institutions, but we are truly global in terms of the LIGO scientific collaboration. And we also partner with our colleagues in Virgo and CAGRA. Those are detectors in Italy and in Japan, respectively. And I'll talk more about them a bit later. So what are these gravitational waves all about? Well, in 2015, we made the first ever detection of gravitational waves. We announced that in February 2016. Here's the LIGO webpage from that date. And this was a big deal. It was publicized on more than 900 newspaper front pages around the world because this was 100 years after these gravitational waves had been predicted by Einstein as a core prediction of his general theory of relativity. So what exactly are they? Gravitational waves emerge from Einstein's picture of gravity, thinking about gravity not as a force between massive bodies, but a curving of space-time itself. And when we imagine the curvature of space-time, we often use a metaphor a bit like shown here, where we take a massive body like the Earth and we plonk it down on, let's think of it like a giant trampoline, and we see the curving of the surface of the trampoline as a metaphor for the curving of space-time. But where gravitational waves come in is when that curvature is changing, as would happen, for example, when you have two massive bodies 
orbiting very rapidly around each other, just like shown in this cartoon. So the change in curvature produces waves, gravitational waves, that spread out through the universe at the speed of light. And they are very weak. They're very hard to detect. And the reason for that is really summed up in one of the only equations I'm going to use. There's one or two scattered through the talk, but we can mainly talk about all of this without recourse to lots of mathematical detail. But this equation is worth a moment's pause to think about, because what this shows on the left-hand side is the quantity that we seek to measure, the perturbation, the change in the curvature of space-time. And that's produced by all the terms on the right-hand side. And it involves something called the mass quadrupole moment. So that's what's changing rapidly in the cartoon as those two masses orbit around each other. And it depends on the second time derivative of that. But look at the constants in front of that. So there's big G, 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11. And that's divided by the speed of light to the power of four. So straight away, what that tells us is that you need a very, very large mass quadrupole moment, and it needs to be changing very rapidly in order to produce a perturbation that we could ever hope to measure because that coupling constant, the big G over C to the fourth, is so small. And what makes it worse is that we're dividing that by the distance of what we call the luminosity distance to a gravitational wave source. And let's face it, you don't really want two colliding black holes in your backyard. So the chances are these sources are going to be very far away. And that means that the perturbation by the time it reaches us will be even weaker. So how weak are we talking about? Well, that's where it gets really interesting because the reason it took us about 100 years to develop the technology to detect these gravitational waves is because of the incredible weakness of these gravitational waves compared with our everyday experience. We're talking about a disturbance in our patch of space-time equivalent to about one million millionth the width of a human hair, or equivalent to the width of a hair over a distance between us and Alpha Centauri. So to build a detector capable of sensing that change in space-time curvature is an enormous technological challenge. And I wish I had more time to talk about that today because Glasgow has had a very leading global role in developing that technology as well. I'll mention it briefly along the way. But in essence, we do it using laser interferometry. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And there are two LIGO facilities. There's LIGO Hanford and Livingston, shown on the left and right in the top of the diagram. And the little animation is giving a representation of what goes on inside the LIGO detector. We take a laser beam with a very well-known wavelength, very precisely measured wavelength, and we split that beam into two. They go along perpendicular directions. The beam bounces off mirrors at the ends of the arms and is then recombined. And when a gravitational wave passes by, it will stretch and squeeze space-time in such a way to change the path traveled by those two beams so that the beams will interfere with each other, hence LIGO being a laser interferometer. And that interference pattern and how it changes is the characteristic that tells us we've got a passing gravitational wave. Now, all of that is rendered much, much more difficult because the ground shakes as well. And there's all manner of local disturbances not to do with gravitational waves, not to do with black holes colliding out there in the universe, but which could swamp the signal that we're trying to detect. So one of the key technological advances that made LIGO possible was to develop a suspension system that would isolate the mirrors at the ends of the arms from the surrounding environment. And Glasgow played a very lead role in that in upgrading the LIGO detectors to an advanced configuration known as advanced LIGO that made them sensitive enough to finally detect gravitational waves, effectively to make them the quietest spot in the universe because the, the mirrors would be isolated from the local noise that could swamp the astrophysical signals we were seeking to detect. So all of that takes us to September 2015, when the detectors were ready, they were upgraded to their advanced configuration, sensitive to this million millionth the width of a hair, and basically we were ready to listen to what the universe might throw at us. 
And on September 14th, actually a few days before we'd intended to begin our first detection run, we got our first signal. And you've maybe seen this plot before. It's been shown in so many different um, media around the world, but it shows the change in the space-time curvature um, inferred for the LIGO, Hanford and Livingston detectors. And the first thing to note is that the patterns are very similar despite the detectors being 3,000 kilometers apart. And that tells us that this is much more likely to be a true astrophysical signal than a local disturbance. And the statistical methods that we use to really quantify that statement, what we call the false alarm rate, draw upon some of the statistical principles that you would learn about in the advanced state analysis class, for example. And to be a bit more specific about some of that, here are some figures from the first detection paper that was published in February 2016, six months later, after many months of painstakingly checking that we had analyzed the data correctly. So what we see is what's known as the in-spiral merger and ring down signal, which we interpret as coming from the collision of two black holes, just like we saw on the previous um, cartoon. And that produces this characteristic pattern where the frequency increases up to the merger of the black holes, and then um, you get maximum amplitude when they merge, and then the signal fades away. Space-time space wobbles a little more, and then things settle down. So um, looking at the way that we analyze these data, a figure uh, that's very crucial in that very first paper is the one shown on the right, and it shows our estimates of the masses of the black holes that produce this gravitational wave signal. And this is really um, a core example of the kinds of statistical machinery that you would learn about in the MSC, because it's equipping us with the means to derive what are called posterior distributions for the parameters of our physical models. So we learn all about that in your MSC programs in the context of what's called Bayesian inference, which I've worked in really throughout my entire career, but I've seen those methods grow to be much, much more commonly used in physics and astronomy than they were when I was a student like you are. So the essence of Bayes' theorem is to combine what we knew before, what we call prior information, with the influence of our observations or experimental measurements to update our understanding of what we know now. And you learn all about Bayesian inference in the advanced data analysis class. And well, how do we use Bayesian inference to analyze the astronomy data that we get from LIGO and indeed our partner Virgo? Well, we saw before the posterior distributions, as we call them, on the masses of the black holes, but we can also learn more about the sources. We can, for example, pinpoint them on the sky. We can combine the data across the different detectors and triangulate where the gravitational waves came from. So that's another element of our analysis method that draws very heavily on the techniques you would learn about in the MSC. So what exactly have we learned from all of this? So if we look at a couple of real landmark events over the last five years, we've already mentioned the very first detection. Let me jump forward now to 2017, because that was when Virgo joined our network, also upgraded to Advanced Virgo, and that allowed us to localize the position of these sources on the sky much better because having three detectors lets us triangulate the position much more effectively. And that paid dividends very quickly because in August 20, 2017, we localized within just a few weeks of Virgo joining a black hole merger much more precisely than the previous detections we'd made up until then, including that very first one. So the first one, we were confident it was gravitational waves coming from the merger of two black holes, but we didn't know very well which direction on the sky those gravitational waves had come from. Having three detectors in the network was the real game changer. And just a few days later, it would bear spectacular further fruit, which we'll come to in a moment. But let me just momentarily jump ahead to 2018. And in December 2018, we'd accumulated by then 11 different events, including 10 black hole mergers, and we packaged those up as our first catalog of gravitational wave events. So we were already moving from being interested in individual events to learning about the population. And that again involves 
drawing upon a lot of Bayesian inference tools, which you would be learning about in your MSc program. That let us do things like test Einstein's GR, general relativity, to see whether that was an effective description of gravitational wave signals. And the bottom line is basically Einstein's pretty happy because so far GR has passed all the statistical tests that we've subjected it to. And again, this relates very closely to things that are covered in your MSc courses, specifically the Advanced Data Analysis course. It involves um, a lot of computational methodology that's become extremely powerful in gravitational wave and, and indeed many other fields of physics using what are called um, Monte Carlo methods, Monte Carlo integration, Markov chain methods, nested sampling, a whole bunch of others. And another aspect of that where Glasgow is really leading the way is looking at ways in which we can speed up those calculations further by using machine learning. And my colleague, Chris Messenger, is one of the pioneers of this in our field. And we're also working closely with colleagues in other schools in the college to develop the very latest methods and apply them to our new field. So let's just um, wrap things up in the next few minutes by just highlighting some of the other things that we've learned from this first few years of gravitational wave astrophysics. So firstly, um, just a few days after Virgo joined the network, we got a real spectacular success in the observation, not of a pair of black holes colliding, but a pair of neutron stars. And why that was so significant is that it was accompanied by electromagnetic observations across the whole spectrum. So firstly, that meant that we could confirm that the gamma ray burst that we saw, just like we'd seen other gamma ray bursts before, was indeed coming from the merger of two neutron stars, just as theory had predicted. And that gamma ray burst collision allowed us to combine the gravitational wave observations and the electromagnetic observations to begin to gain insights about the, the nature of the environment around the gamma ray burst. This is another topic where Glasgow has global leadership in that multi-messenger approach to combining observations. It's allowed us, among other things, to put limits on the speed of light compared with the speed of gravity. And GR says that they should be identical, but now observationally we can constrain that very tightly. Um, an area that I particularly have been involved in uh, leading the global effort is in using that binary neutron star merger to try to measure the expansion rate of the universe. We were able to do that by combining the distance we get from gravitational waves with the redshift that we get from the host galaxy. So we needed to identify the host galaxy to make this happen. Now, our individual estimate of what we call the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe, from only one event is not terribly precise. You can see that in this diagram here. The posterior on the Hubble constant is very broad. But we're in the same ballpark as traditional methods based on electromagnetic techniques. And those methods are really causing cosmologists to scratch their heads right now because they don't agree with each other. So our hope is that in the future, gravitational waves will be able to help address and solve that tension between the values of the Hubble constant coming from different um, methods. Um, all of that is based on an approach that we call cosmology with standard sirens. And again, I won't take the time to go through all of this in detail, but these are all topics that underpin the courses that you would learn about in the astrophysics and theoretical physics MSc. And you would indeed have the opportunity to take as optional um, some of these courses, even in the other programs as well. In 2022, we expect that our next observing run will begin. And that's roughly when another very important ground-based telescope called the Rubin Observatory will begin operations too. So this process of associating an electromagnetic counterpart with a gravitational wave signal, that's going to get better, and largely thanks to the availability of better electromagnetic telescopes. Now, let me just skip these ones to save a little time, but let me jump ahead to what's happening with LIGO right now. I mentioned 2022 as our next sort of target date. Well, we are still busy analyzing data from our last observing run. That ran from 2019, March, through to March 2020. And it was uh, terminated a little bit early because of COVID. But what we did during that third observing run, it began on April 1st, 
just after the build-up in late March. Um, we put out public alerts about our gravitational wave candidate events. So that was a big change as well. It meant that actually anyone in the world could follow as these candidate events were announced. Now, there was a lot of them. You can see the steep increase in the event rate between the first two observing runs in 2015 and 2016 um, through to August 2017. And then we had the gap. And from April 2019, we've been detecting events much more frequently, typically about once every six days. There's a whole bunch of interesting candidate events that we've been able to confirm. And I won't uh, talk about them here, but again, people might have questions about the kinds of things we've been learning from them. So there's a real um, zoo of different candidates that you can see here. So that's been keeping us busy so far, but we're now looking to plan ahead to what comes next. We've got our catalog, our updated catalog of 50 gravitational wave events that we've confirmed so far. We're still analyzing the rest of the third observing run while still learning all that we possibly can from the ones we've published so far, like, for example, improving our tests of general relativity, building on much of the material that you would learn about in the MSc courses. And in 2022, when our fourth observing run begins, we anticipate that the detection rate will increase again because we're upgrading the detectors to make them even more sensitive. So that's where we're headed. We're looking at having a detection every day or two, and it doesn't stop there because looking towards the end of this decade, we will have more detectors joining our network. Kagra in Japan that I mentioned some time ago, Kagra will begin its operations in 2022, but a little bit beyond that, towards the end of this decade, we'll have another detector, LIGO India. And having all of them operating together will give us much better sky localization capabilities. The other thing to note is that the ground-based detectors that have already borne such fantastic results, well, it doesn't stop there because there's a whole spectrum of gravitational waves. And Glasgow has also got a leading role in developing the space-borne detector LISA that is set to fly in 2034. Now, that might seem a long way off, but a lot of the key research that needs to be done for LISA needs to be done now. So there will be opportunities for master students to get involved in projects, you know, laying the foundations for the LISA science that we will do in the 2030s.